Welcome to Digital Charcuterie. Welcome back. It's me, Andrew Fantasia, and it's time for another Marvel United Deep Deep Dive. As usual, if you enjoyed this video, please feel free to give it a thumbs up, give some love to the subscribe button, comment, bell, stuff. You know, you'd think by now I would know these things off by heart. I'll tell you what I do know off by heart, though. Every single word in my fantasy novels, we were wizards. Is that a lie? I don't know. Let's see. Page 134. They crept carefully down the slope. Let's see how right I am. Let's see how right I am. Page 134. It's happening. How does it start? There was a chorus of hasty affirmatives that satisfied the two wizards. Okay. Close enough? You can find my fantasy... Whoops. You can find my fantasy novels, We Were Wizards, on Amazon in three different formats. Check them out. They're self-published. They're my babies. Uh, and if you're a fantasy fan, you are going to find a ton of fun. You already know you're going to find a, a slew of affirmatives that satisfy wizards. So that was a sneak preview just for you. Today on Digital Charcuterie's Deep Dive, we are diving deep into arguably the most popular, most beloved expansion in this entire breadth of Marvel United content. And I don't like using that word content, but it it really does kind of sum up the, the feeling of the Marvel United community. Everybody raises the heck, rightfully so, out of the Sinister Six expansion. And we're going to take a look at exactly why that is. If you don't own this and you're contemplating owning this, y'all better own this. Let's go take a look at exactly why that's the case. And here she is, the absolute gorgeous tapestry here that is Return of the Sinister Six. Uh, it never makes it clear what they're returning from, but I am going to assume it's probably Chili's. You know, they went to Chili's, they had a nice big lunch, they occupied a large booth, and when they were done, they were like, okay, uh, we'll dine and dash because we're bad guys, and then we'll go beat up Spider-Man. So that's what the return means. That's canon now. Uh, let's flip it over and take a look at the back of this box. And we know what we've got in here is all villainy goodness. This box is the box that sold me on Marvel United. Because we all know that original base game was pretty light. Uh, not bad, just very, very light. And Marvel is a world of so many characters and so many possibilities. And I was like, well, it'd be nice to see more of those characters and possibilities. And then I scrolled down on their Kickstarter page and I saw this and I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, that's that's a thing I want. And uh, at this point, it was season two that was out. So I got this plus a whole bunch of mutants and everything. So I'm very thankful I was able to get this because this is now extremely hard to get your hands on. Aftermarket sellers know how popular these characters are. And boy, do they ever exploit that, unfortunately. So inside you will find... A rule book. It's a thin one. It's thinner than the Infinity Gauntlet one, but it's still a book and not a leaflet. Let's read the rule blurb, the little colorful flavor stuff together. Perhaps it required someone with an intellect as towering as Dr. Otto Octavius to conclude that heroes are much stronger and more effective working as a group, and villains should therefore adopt the same tactics. Naturally, villains are mistrustful of each other, and therein lies the problem. But with someone like Doc Ock in charge, and by executing successful plan after successful plan, even the most misanthropic villain can see the advantages of teamwork. Enter the Sinister Six. Dr. Octopus has called together the most dangerous villains in New York City, united by their hatred of Spider-Man. Between Electro's raw power, Sandman's incredible strength, Vulture's tech-savvy, Kraven's savage cunning, and Mysterio's mind-bending illusions, Dr. Octopus has the makings of an Avengers-level threat. With the Six working together, even Earth's mightiest heroes will fall before their collective villainy. Bringing the Six to justice will require coordination, planning, quick thinking, and teamwork, the likes of which the evil Six can only dream of. Let us show the Sinister Six that even villains working in concert are no match for heroes that stand united. Ah, that's a great written blurb. I like that so much. Inside, you will find, as usual, an overview of all the components and an overview of Sinister Six mode, which we will talk about in a bit. And I want to clarify something that came up during Infinity Gauntlet, but a game mode is, uh, I grant it more points than a game challenge because they are different. 
Uh, that's sorry, that's just an amazing chibi Dr. Octopus. It looks so cool. Uh, a game mode is something like this or like Infinity Gauntlet where it's almost its own little micro game played using the same United rules, but just shaking things up in a bigger way than a challenge would. A challenge just kind of does what it says. It adds an extra challenge. But this is a mode, baby, and modes are worth more. And you can tell it's worth more because it's got a bigger dashboard. Introducing our first oversized hexagonal villain dashboard, the Return of the Sinister Six, and there it is right there. Uh, we're going to take a look at that in just a minute, but bear with me. Inside here is a nice little well, very shallow well, but it's just enough to hold these six regular villain dashboards. Here they are, it's Electro and Dr. Octopus and Sandman and Vulture. Oh, Vulture, I can't beat him. And Mysterio and Craven, or as they love to call him in the cartoon, Sergei. <laughs> uh, his real name is Sergei Kravinov. There you go. Now you know his name. Um, as you can see, Sinister Six certainly has an affinity for yellow, purple, and green. If there's a, a hot topic of yellow, purple, and green, that's where they're doing their shopping. Those are the villain dashboards. Uh, let's see. Mysterio has a special setup. So does Vulture. Everybody else is pretty standard. So those are the two more complicated ones. But as I said with Infinity Gauntlet. It's so wonderful that not only do they give us a box that contains this giant crazy new mode, but just to fit in with the rest of everything, these six villains are all separately, completely playable. Mmm, magnificent. I can't do a chef's kiss because my mouth is not on screen, but this is the mmm, chef's kiss. Let's get rid of the plastic sheath here and take a look inside at our cards. It's just master plan decks in here. Uh, let's see, there's vultures on the bottom. I still have never beaten the vulture. He is excruciatingly difficult. He's up there with Green Goblin. I'm sure plenty of people better than me have beaten him, but man, I just cannot get my head around his whole uh, stealing crisis tokens things, his loot things. It's just, it baffles me every time. Here's Dr. Octopus's deck, and it's cool how they use each other as henchmen. It's fitting for some of them. You know, Doc Ock would definitely use them as henchmen. I think Green Goblin has henchmen, which is weird. I never associated him as a guy with henchmen, but, you know, it is what it is. Sandman has henchmen, which is also strange, but it's cool. They included everybody together, one big happy family. In fact, if they ever wanted to make a Sinister Six sitcom, even an animated one in the style of the Harley Quinn show, man, that would be a lot of fun. So there are your master plan decks on one side let me just pop that back in there and on this side as you can see there's something a little bit different uh you have your return of the sinister six deck so we'll get to that momentarily as well uh but on top of that you've got the other ones you've got mysterio's deck here he's got a very unique threat setup where they're all face down because that's mysterio a uh, very unique villain and then sergey Craven the Hunter himself. And now here you have the return, whoops, return of the Sinister Six deck. Uh, and it comes with master plan cards and it also comes with weak spot cards. So the way this works is you would take your Sinister Six dashboard and you would play that out and you would put everybody's weak spot on top of their designated part of the dashboard. And then once you have that, you're ready to go. So you have to go around the board and you have to eliminate the weak spots. The weak spots are just a little challenge where you have to play these certain actions on the same space as that villain. And once you do, you know, you put the token on there just like a threat card. And when it's uh, full, you can get rid of the weak spot and that uncovers their health. And now it makes them vulnerable to damage. So they always start under pressure, which is a rule I forget a lot when I play against Sinister Six and it always messes me up but they're always under pressure, so it's difficult. But once you get to their weak spot and get out of the way, you can start taking them out. And yes, Vulture is much easier here than he is when you face him by himself. But it's a very tricky fight because everybody's doing different things. And if you don't keep on top of it and keep the right plate spinning, you're going to have a bad time. Uh, I played this with my friend a couple times in a row, and he and I were just, um, we, we 
targeted somebody, I can't remember who, I think it was like Dr. Octopus or something. We targeted somebody that we thought was going to be the biggest threat. But then meanwhile, in the background, Sandman is there just accumulating health like a monster because that's what he does. And before we knew it, we turned around and Sandman had like 25 health and we're like, well, we definitely can't win this game now. So you have to suss out who is the biggest threat. It's usually Sandman or Vulture and get them out of the way first. And then you can just have your way with everybody else. Uh, and they have their own master plan deck here, which is pretty simple. It's just like a normal master plan deck, except that has everybody's picture on it. You draw the top card of the deck. Uh, you have to activate the first two villains uh, and then they each do a thing. So they'll both move, they'll both bam. The first villain who moves will place a thug and the second will place a civilian. And they have everybody because in this case, if everybody was on the board, you would put Electro and then Vulture and then the other guys don't get a turn this turn. But let's say Vulture was dead. Uh, or, you know, you got rid of him already. So you would just skip to the next person. So you would move Electro and then Sandman. So it's whoever's left over in order from top to bottom. That's how these work. Super, super simple and a very fun new game mode. All right, it's miniature time. And man, it was hard sussing out what was going to be my favorite miniature in this box. I guess my least favorite, I mean, they're all, they're all so good. I guess my least favorite might be Electro. And I, I don't even have a reason for that. I Like, they're just, these are all incredible miniatures. Uh, no pun intended, but they broke the mold here. Uh, there's Electro with all his electric glory. I'm sorry, Jamie Foxx, I love you. But to me, it's not Electro unless he's got big electric starfish thing going on on his head. Oh man, what a great villain. And this guy was sadly left out of almost all of the Spider-Man cartoon that I watched growing up. And when they finally did bring him back, he was like a Nazi clone or something. He was very different from what Electro is supposed to be. Uh, so thankfully we got good old vanilla Electro here to keep us company. Next, let's go with, uh, let's go with Craven. Craven's just a great, solid Spider-Man villain. And again, a, a nice big spear. Beautiful spear. He's in a, a hunting pose. They've got the detail on his lion jacket. He quotes this poem in the cartoon when he's fighting Spider-Man, uh, where he says, I have known great fear in the lights, the silver of the Prussian moons, the crimson of the Prussian nights. Uh, that's just, how cool is it that in that show... This cartoon meant for kids, this dumb little cartoon, we have this villain reciting uh, Eastern European poetry to Spider-Man while he's fighting him. Like, that show was just off the hook. Uh, but that's a great Craven, uh, And I think they did this guy wonderful justice in the Spider-Man 2 video game, that last one that came out. That's the best Craven I've ever seen. Uh, and I don't think the movie is going to top that, but we'll see. Hopefully it does, but I'm not holding my breath. We'll go with Sandman next. Just an interesting mold for Sandman, especially because this big chunky part right here where it's just sand and grit. I wonder, I'm curious, you know, for Tiago and for the other people who, who mold these for the games, I wonder if this sort of thing is easier or harder because it's just a big lump of clay, right? A big lump of plastic or whatever. It's, uh, it doesn't have to be a specific human shape until you get to the top. So I wonder if this was easier and more fun for them to sculpt. But man, is that great or what? Uh, when I picture Sandman, this is what I always picture. He's got the striped shirt. Uh, he's making some sort of spike or hammer or something with his sand. There's another version of Sandman that I think was big in the 90s where he looked very different. And I'm like, nah, nah, nah. This isn't doing it for me at all. So I'm glad we have him. And he was also left out of the Spider-Man 90s cartoon because apparently James Cameron was going to make a movie with Sandman and Electro. So Fox said, uh, you guys can't do those characters because James Cameron is going to use them. And we all know how that wonderful James Cameron Spider-Man movie turned out, right? So what a waste. We could have had two more great characters in that show. Next, I will go with the Vulture. Uh, just a beautiful, big, winged monstrosity. Look at him. The way they have him posing, he's just looming. He's such a big threat. Uh, all of these characters are very classically rendered. Uh, and when I say that, I mean they made them look like their most classic 1960s uh, versions of themselves, except the vulture. The vulture here is definitely modeled after the Michael Keaton homecoming vulture with that big pilot hat and the goggles and the little furry like aviation jacket that he's got um, and the mechanical 
wings. Uh, the older Vulture is much simpler. He doesn't have the helmet. He's just an old, bald man. And I'm fine either way. I think they're both great versions of the character. Neither of them looks hideous, in my opinion. So, a great Vulture. And next we'll go with, um, oh boy, Dr. <laughs> it's so hard to choose. Dr. Octopus is going to be next. There he is. Shemp Howard haircut, goggles, arms, arms, arms. And they're a little bit flexible, just the tiniest bit flexible so that they don't snap, thankfully, because that would suck if they snapped. We're not playing Marvel Snap here, folks. We're playing Marvel United. I don't want any snapping to happen. And man, that must have been tricky to mold. And I can only imagine how difficult it would be to paint uh, to get at his back. But they did it. They got Dr. Octopus. I was always in awe of um, the action figures of him growing up. It's like, that must have cost so much to make those action figures. So no wonder he was hard to find. He was almost deluxe. And in the cartoon, they made him, they gave him this Bavarian accent. So he sounded a little bit like Schwarzenegger. So if you've never seen it, he sounded like this. Spider-Man, I'm going to use my robots to take over the world. Uh, <laughs> very over the top. I, I love that version of Doc Ock. He was voiced by a, an actor named Ephraim Zimbalist Jr., um, who I don't believe had that accent in real life. I think he had just an American or British accent. And fun fact, it's the same actor who voiced Alfred in the Batman animated series. So there you go. We got some DC crossover already. And finally, my favorite piece in here is Mysterio. Mysterio is just one of the coolest looking villains of all time. People think he's dorky. I don't care. Uh, and he's walking on this giant cloud of mist uh, and smoke that he conjures up. My buddy Ryan, who does the Marvel Infinity Rewatch podcast with me, this is his favorite Spider-Man villain. And uh, I think the first time he came over, he was like, let's play Mysterio, man. And we did. And what a great, great looking villain piece. They just nailed it. Beautiful cape, beautiful helmet, beautiful everything. Now it's time to put everything back and pack it away. I have a couple of things that I keep in here. I keep two more villain decks in here. I keep Rhino and Shocker because they, um, in the cartoon, there was a different version of these guys called the Insidious Six. I know you guys are probably thinking, Andrew, if you love that cartoon so much, why don't you marry it? Uh, trust me, I've tried. Um, the, they had the Insidious Six in the cartoon, which was a different lineup because there was no Shocker and no Electro. And Vulture wasn't a part of the group. He was doing his own thing. So you basically had Mysterio, Doc Ock, and not even Craven. You had Mysterio and Doc Ock, and then you had these two, and then you had Scorpion and Chameleon. And that was your Insidious Six. But Scorpion's got his own box, and Chameleon's got a lot of little fiddly parts, so I keep him where he stays. But these two are much simpler, uh, and they both come in promo boxes as well. So I just keep them in here along with everything else. And then we close this up here, and we'll just drop Rhino and Shocker's dashboards down here. And then everybody else's dashboards on top. And it's still nice and snug. There's only the tiniest, tiniest amount of overflow, barely enough to make it, not even enough to make a difference. Because as you can see, it all closes up just peachy. So there it is, the Sinister Six box. As you'll see very shortly when we tally up the points that it's worth, it's definitely some bang for some buck. I'll tell you that right now. If you don't know how the point system works, I'd suggest checking out our first deep dive video where we lay out exactly what everything is worth and why it's worth that. But you're smart enough, you'll figure it out very soon. So let's take a look at how many points of worthiness we can give to return of the Sinister Six. It comes with six miniatures, which gives us six beautiful points right there. It also comes with six villains. Dr. Octopus, Electro, Sandman, Mysterio, Vulture, and Craven. Six villains equals 12 whopping points. And finally, you have the Sinister Six mode, which is a brand new game mode unto itself. And that gives us two points. Putting Return of the Sinister Six at a healthy, crisp, 20 total points of worthiness. Now, if you remember last week, we gave Infinity Gauntlet 21 points, and that extra one point was edged up there because of the Infinity Gauntlet and the gems that came with it, right? That's what pushed it over the top there. So it does technically have more points of worthiness than the Sinister Six expansion. However, from my point of view, 
you do get more just play and oomph from this box than you do from Infinity Gauntlet, especially the way I play. Remember, I select all of my heroes and villains randomly. And if you look at it just from a purely random mathematical perspective, which I know people love to look at because it just makes everything so much more fun. Ugh, math. But if you look at it randomly mathematically, the Infinity Gauntlet box technically has five villains in it. It has Thanos, his three friends, and the Infinity Gauntlet itself. I put that on my list as a villain. I put that whole game mode because it is a villain mode, sort of. The Sinister Six box technically has seven villains in there. It's got the six characters and then Sinister Six itself is another villain on my list of villains. So the odds of me randomly getting a villain from one box are substantially higher. You know, it's the difference between five and seven. That's, that's two more entries on the list. So even though it's close and even though the edge was given to Infinity Gauntlet because of just the aesthetics and the little gems itself, um, like the, the gifts, the, the tchotchkes of the box. For me, two extra names on the list, especially villain names, which are worth more in my opinion, that ain't half bad. Your mileage may vary with these boxes. They are neck and neck, but I want you to just be cautious to look at them from that point of view too. Even though Sinister Six has one last point, depending on what kind of gamer you are, it might be worth a whole lot more. So we're done with the expansions for season one, everybody. Next time, we're going to take a special look at the Kickstarter promo box. All the stretch goals from season one. That should be fun and time consuming, but we'll do it anyway. So I'll see you here next time on Digital Charcuterie. Thank you so much for tuning in as we continue here to make the wait for DC Superheroes United a little bit shorter and a whole lot sweeter. See you next time.